Okay, so we're going to get started on the next section. Um, mm -hmm. My pleasure to introduce Daniel Ritti, uh, who's going to be talking about cosmology as quantum gravity hydrodynamics and the fate of cosmological singularities. Yeah, thank you. So, and now for something completely different. <laughs> uh, can you hear me okay? So I'm going to discuss uh, uh, a view on cosmology starting from uh, supposedly fundamental quantum gravity theory. So I will first of all uh, outline uh, which perspective on quantum gravity informs uh, the view on cosmology that I'm going to present. And I will keep it general and then try to give uh, examples of the implementation of the view both of cosmology and of quantum gravity in a specific formula. I also apologize for those of you, with those of you who have already heard uh, part of what, or a good part of what I'm going to say in previous uh, conferences or talks. So I hope that on the one hand, repetita uh, um, so you just benefit from listening again to the same thing, in case you're not fully understood them at the beginning, the first time. And, uh, and I also hope that for those who understood it, that uh, Butterfield is right, and that you feel the pleasure of uh, hearing something you actually understand well. So, what happens to space and time uh, in quantum gravity depends uh, on uh, uh, which quantum gravity formula, of course, and also what you mean by quantum gravity. The tradition of the standard in, uh, view is that quantum gravity is a quantum theory of the gravitational field, so it's some quantized version of general relativity or some other classical modified theory. However, there are two points to notice. On the one hand, uh, there are several results in classical and semi-classical gravitational physics that <coughs> seem to suggest uh, uh, a more radical breakdown of the uh, continuum framework and of the whole idea of effective field theory. And I just list uh, some. None of them amounts to a proof. Uh, you can feel that something more serious is suggested by one of them and not by the others. Um, but altogether, I would say, I would argue, give a, a strong case for at least uh, uh, suspecting that something more radical happens uh, uh, down there. In particular, the general suggestion uh, would be some sort of breakdown of locality or breakdown of continuity and therefore uh, some form of discreteness for space time. And both uh, aspects uh, are. Uh, cornerstones of our understanding of uh, what we mean by space-time. Uh, so in this sense, at the moment, uh, either some sort of discreteness is there or uh, some form of non-locality, then uh, you could say the space-time itself is emergent from non-traditionally uh, spatio-temporal uh, building blocks at the, of some quantum nature. So I would call them uh, uh, since we are friends for many years, I would call them uh, colloquially as atoms of space. Um, the second point is that quantum gravity approaches themselves, whenever they come up with the more concrete proposals for what the fundamental degrees of freedom uh, uh, of the theory are, um, they seem to suggest uh, fundamental degrees of freedom that again are not just quantized uh, uh, continuum geometric fields. Uh, this is true in several quantum gravity approach. In the following, we focus on only one of them to give an example, a more concrete implementation. So somehow space and time disappear as we know them and they're substituted by something else. And I found no um, uh, more realistic picture of what's going on nor anything coming from experiments. So, uh, again, let me reiterate, the general idea is that quantum gravity should rather be understood as a microscopic theory of uh, some form of pre-geometric uh, uh, quantum degree of freedom, degrees of freedom. So a quantum theory of the, <coughs> of the atoms of space. In this view, the gravitational field itself is not fundamental, it's the result of collective dynamics of something else. Uh, space-time and geometry are emergent entities obtained from some form of cross-graining of fundamental 
more fundamental degrees of freedom. So in, in this sense, you can also say that uh, almost by uh, definition, quantum space is some sort of background independent quantum many body system. This is not per se a, a non-trivial statement. The moment I have quantum degrees of freedom, they are interacting, I have a quantum many body system. The point is just to emphasize the shift in perspective. Uh, in particular, the extraction of space-time from such a system and uh, of cosmology uh, becomes as similar to the typical problem in condensed matter theory, that is uh, to go from some atoms to some uh, effective macroscopic uh, description. So it's just the shift in perspective that I'm emphasizing. So space-time is emergent, fine, and but I would like to also refine a little bit the notion, pointing out several possibilities and uh, several senses in which uh, space and time could be emergent. What I call level zero, uh, space-time can emerge simply because, uh, like in any quantized uh, gravitational theory, so in the more traditional perspective, uh, classical space-time has to uh, emerge from a quantum space-time. Um, but still, the fundamental degrees of freedom are quantum continuum geometries. This is, okay, is a form of emergence of space and time. However, if uh, continuum space-time and geometry are obtained from uh, you know, different uh, structures, then you, you are asked, uh, are they just a regularization tool? In which case, there's nothing more fundamental to think about. Uh, the physics is still a fully continuum one. Or are they physical? If they're physical, then you have a different sense in which things emerge. Is what I mentioned earlier. You have to go from some fundamental atoms of space to a continuum space-time, and this will involve necessarily approximations. There will be no space-time outside a certain approximate regime. This is what I would call more properly emergence of space and time. In general, if uh, uh, you go from uh, uh, microscopic fundamental degrees of freedom to collective uh, descriptions and approximate descriptions, this, is, uh, this generates a variety of possible phases for your uh, fundamental system. If different phases are possible, and again, uh, they are physical, then uh, you have a second level, meaning that you also have to realize that uh, the emergence of space-time is not only approximate, but it's also possible only in one of the particular phases, one or more of the particular phases of the underlying system. And this is, okay, you can call it emergent plus or be a bit more clever than I am in finding names. If the atoms of space are physical and they can organize in different phases, then you can ask, are they all the different phases physical? or again just artifacts of the mathematics of my theory. If they're physical, then maybe the phase transitions are physical and a whole new uh, whole, um, level of questions is raised. Uh, and the transition from uh, a non-geometric to a geometric phase uh, already at the continuum level for the full system uh, would be something that you also need to characterize and is uh, what I call geometric genesis. So there may be some new physics there as well. And so again, in the same uh, lack of uh, creativity, I call it emergence plus plus. So let me say a few more words about uh, the implications of the different levels. So at level zero, when you just go quantum, but you keep uh, the same type of degrees of freedom, you still have different variants as in the continuum theory, so you can still argue in, as in the classical theory. So in a sense, uh, there's, no, so there's no preferred time, no preferred space. Um, and generic solutions of the theory would not select any preferred directions in time or space. Uh, and then you have quantum nature for all the space-time observables. But the fundamental entities are still space-time fields. Still, you have a lot of physical and conceptual issues, as uh, you, you know very well. So you have to identify physical quantum states and observables, first of all, as part of the construction of the theory. Then you have to control the classical approximation of those physical states and observables, and that's a super hard problem in any uh, quantum uh, field theory. And then you have to make sense at the more conceptual level of the quantum nature of space-time. 
possibility of fluctuations in causality in uh, you know any geometric quantity and so on. It's already a, a list of very very hard problems per se. Uh, I'm just going to point out that unfortunately it's even worse than this. Um, one way to extract uh, maybe an approximate notion of time and space at that level is the usual relational strategy in which you select some internal degree of freedom to play the role of a clock or a rod and that gives you a notion of uh, locality and evolution. In any case, even staying at this level, I'm going to argue you need new foundations for quantum mechanics because all of quantum mechanical interpretations I know of rely heavily on, uh, on notions of space and time. So we are in big trouble already here. When you go to non-spatial temporal entities, uh, things are worse because uh, uh, you still need to control uh, the quantum properties and dynamics of the fundamental entities. You need to have a theory, and it's a hard problem. Uh, and then you also have to identify a new level, a new type of approximation. You have to show in what approximation you have some approximate notion of continuous space time and geometry. Maybe still quantum, so you reach level zero. You still haven't done. Um, but of course, to be a physical theory, you need observational signatures of all, everything you're saying. Otherwise, it just works. At the more conceptual level, I frankly do not know. That's one question. That step may not be necessary, right? It may observational <laughs> signatures. In... No, no, no. The passing from the atoms of space-time to some type of continuum, mm -hmm. quantum yeah, 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 space-time. Yeah, sure. You sure, should, sure. Somehow you can go directly to a classical space time. There may not be that step. I agree, I agree. I'm just saying that conceptually there are these different steps. Uh, you, you may be able to take you know, both at once if you want, or just bypass completely one set of problems and uh, arrive directly to the classical Or never have the possibility of having that. Sure, sure. I'm just listing you know, the logical possibilities on the table. Then. Uh, at the conceptual level, you are in big metaphysical troubles in the, at, already at level uh, one because uh, you know, I am not aware of uh, well defined notions of identity, change, uh, causation, and so on without space time that somehow implicitly do not rely on some notion of space and time. So you have to re do a lot of uh, work. Um, if you have different phases, then, okay, you need to study them at the, at the physical and mathematical level. That you can also decide as philosophers to leave that uh, to physicists. Uh, but again, the same ontological and epistemological problem will acquire a whole new level of complexity. You have to deal, in particular, with degrees of freedom that, uh, because they can equally well, depending on parameters or additional conditions, give rise uh, to a geometric phase in which in some further approximation you have a space-time, but also same degrees of freedom give rise to a non-geometric phase in which no approximation gives you a nice space-time, it means that those degrees of freedom are even more deprived of spatial-temporal features than you may have suspected or hoped uh, at level one. Uh, the moment you consider the possible physical uh, uh, um, nature of phase transitions, well, somehow it means that you want to give some physical meaning to the motion in theory space, in the space of coupling constants, in the space of possible effective uh, theories. And again, that's also not uh, easy. So we'll discuss all of that later on in some examples. In one example, I'll just list again uh, the, the various levels uh, to, so that you can keep them in mind. And when I discuss uh, some co more concrete implementation, you try to identify all these elements uh, in more concrete terms. OK, so now I give you an example of a formalism. I, of course, I don't give you the details about the formulas. They're totally well, they are sort of irrelevant for, for most of what I'm going to say. The basic idea is usually a picture, and it's just that uh, you start from the assumption that your fundamental degrees of freedom can be pictured in a, to help your intuition as little uh, building blocks, uh, tetrahedral, or use some other polyhedron, doesn't matter. Uh, 
which a priori, so in general, in the most general state, are not even connected with one another, and in fact even the discrete geometry is not sharply defined. But that the sort of degrees of freedom at the quantum level that in a classical limit individually would give you simplicial building blocks. You can, uh, the second point uh, that may be relevant is simply that uh, you can characterize the simplicial classical and then quantum geometry of these building blocks, the tetrahedra, in terms of purely algebraic data taken from uh, uh, the uh, groups and representation theory. That's the only content of this slide. You can define fully the geometry of the tetrahedron, either using, at the classical level, either using this uh, phase space, the cotangent bundle of the rotation group, or, uh, uh, with some co extra conditions, the cotangent bundle of the Lorentz group. And there is a relation between the two, and you can write down all the equations relating the two descriptions. In practice, the implication of this is just that uh, your classical and then quantum theory of a single or many tetrahedra is based on a Hilbert space that could be given just as uh, functions on the group. That's the only point. Second point is that once you have one tetrahedra described by this type of Hilbert space, you can take a Fox space. You can of course, now with the functional analytic uh, subtleties, but let's take, uh, instead of one, you have n copies, you have n particle state. Then you take n uh, possibly to infinity of the full Fox space. And you can rewrite the old theory in terms of creation and annihilation operators. And any observable, like the total volume you can attribute to a generic state, is the sum of the contributions for the simplicial volumes of each of them which are well-defined discrete quantities uh, for each building block. This would be four volume. Three volume. These are tet well, tet tetrahedra. So tetrahedra oh, are three it. building blocks. Are three-dimensional building blocks. I thought you were starting from simplicial... Three-dimensional. No, no, no. Uh, that's the picture. Three-dimensional building block. Oh. And if you want to think uh, in oh, to space. a little bit ahead space. in 4D, that this is sort of boundary data for a four-dimensional would-be space-time. These are the states, and then you have to tell me about histories or interaction processes. So you have uh, many quantum tetrahedra, and you have uh, uh, what is basically a field theory description for them, because it's a second quantized picture for uh, the uh, uh, many-body system. And uh, the Fock vacuum means that there's no tetrahedron, no degree of freedom whatsoever. Uh, single particle state, a tetrahedron, labeled by algebraic data. Many-body states, including those in which you glue together the tetrahedra. These are additional conditions of the uh, many body uh, states. Then you can actually, so, okay, then again, a generic state will be no, not spacey at all. They will have, will have no property of the space, not even at the discrete level. If you start connecting them, at least you have some notion of discrete uh, uh, space, but you are again farther rem far removed from any continuum of space or uh, space time. If you write down a few <coughs> actions for that, you're specifying a model for the dynamics of such a system. Yeah? So can you go back can you go back and explain how they are connected? How they uh, I didn't explain it because I didn't say it, but I can tell you the uh, rule for connecting them is if you have two tetrahedra, so you, you can take a tensor product Hilbert space of the two Hilbert spaces for the two tetrahedra. A connected state is a particular type of entangled state between the two. Maximal entangled state, actually. Um, so you can write down uh, uh, a dynamics for such a system at the classical level first. You can think of the possible interactions here. The guiding principle could be, in a class of models, is that uh, you think of uh, the fundamental interaction as the fundamental building block of a four-dimensional discrete uh, space-time. So if you have tetrahedra, the basic way in which you can glue them uh, 
to form a four-dimensional lattice is to consider them as the boundary of the four simplex. And that dictates what sort of interaction we put here. In any case, this is model building. You choose an action that specifies the dynamics for your uh, degrees of freedom. In this class of theories, the quantum level, the result of this type of choices is that when you expand the theory in Feynman diagrams, the diagrams are triangulations to one dimension higher, and the amplitude is what the theory says about the quantum interaction processes about, of these uh, um, diagrams, the quantum probability of such diagrams. So you sum over triangulations with some amplitude. Can you? Yeah. We are, we are used to do these kind of things in field theory, in which we say we specify the dynamics by yeah, proposing by proposing this and interpreting as a Feynman diagram. Mm -hmm. But here we don't have space time. We don't have a rule. We mm -hmm. and, and as you said, we don't even have a quantum theory. The quantum theory would have to be built. No, so far, we have a quantum theory simply in the sense that I can assign probability amplitudes. Probability of what? Okay, wait, I don't want to enter now the discussion about the interpretation of the corresponding quantum theory. We have a quantum theory only in the sense that we have field spaces, uh, uh, scalar products, uh, transitions <coughs> between the two endpoint functions, and so on. The interpretation of that, uh, for some of them we have ideas, for others not. But you use many words that have a heavy interpretational. Yeah, but they also thing, lack like in the mathematical like translation. Of trans sure, I, I agree transitions with that. I'm postponing the question. I don't want to uh, decline answering the question uh, sooner or later. I'm just saying that uh, luckily there is a translation in uh, quantum field theory formulas for all those concepts. Those uh, mathematical translations have the exact counterpart here. The interpretation would have to be worked out uh, almost from scratch for most of them. But it's just I have one hour not Sorry. Two years. <laughs> uh, even to discuss it, let alone solve it, will be a problem. Um, okay, so because of just the ingredients uh, I gave you, uh, I'm justified in uh, uh, mentioning, without explaining, that uh, the type of formalism I discussed uh, has immediate uh, relations uh, to a bunch of other quantum gravity approaches. So it's not something that I, that I or anybody else uh, came up with out of the blue. They've been. Uh, either constructed out of some of these other approaches or related and justified in various ways from other approaches. Um, okay, so we have a good, uh, I can add another piece of information that we have a good understanding of the relation to discrete gravity like regex calculus, uh, lattice gravity, fat integrals uh, uh, for this type of models, for not all of them, but most of them, but still it would be a relation to discrete geometric structures. The continuum limit, from the point of view of this type of uh, uh, more abstract quantum field theories, is the problem of the randomization group of the field theory. It's the problem of controlling uh, a larger number, larger and larger number, of uh, uh, interacting uh, quantum degrees of freedom which is a more abstract way of uh, defining what randomization group flow is about. And uh, so there is a long uh, uh, list of works and literature on, on uh, group field theory renormalization. And uh, uh, the basic idea is just to treat it as an ordinary field theory, again, uh, in terms of the mathematical formulation of the flow. Um, I can, of course, tell you more about it. The general results, only one of which I'm going to use in, in the following as an inspiration, is that uh, we know of large classes of models which are perturbably renormalizable with UV fixed points, even in a fully rigorous sense of mathematical physics. And, they, and at non-perturbative level, there are at least hints, because it's much more difficult, there are hints of the phase transitions including uh, hints of uh, condens uh, condensed phases. This idea of a condensation is what I will bring forward from these more mathematical results uh, to the uh, attempt at extracting effective continuum geometric uh, uh, gravitational physics. Okay. Um, I'm not going to discuss other results. Yes, sir. So 
you see a emergence of the separation between time and space in this approach? Does uh, it look like it look like you're constructing a, a four-dimensional Euclidean theory? No, because uh, the um, signature of the affected continuum description turns out to be uh, the result uh, of the type of group you choose uh, at the beginning, which at first only has interpretation of giving a local uh, light construction inside each uh, building block. But then it percolates if you want to the continuum. So if you, if you use the Lorentz group, the SO3 one, the type of observables you have in the effective continuum will be Lorentzian, and uh, if you start with the Euclidean uh, group only, like spin 4, the four-dimensional rotation group, you only have Euclidean observables later on. This is the general guideline. Of course, so we know from dynamical triangulations from all sorts of other approaches that uh, you have to be very careful in just uh, assuming that because you have some structure at the discrete level, you are going to get a similar structure in the continuum. For example, the dimension could uh, would be very different even if you start with four dimensional building blocks. But okay, this is what we know so far. I'm not going to discuss other results, just to uh, let you know that there are other results. Now, what is cosmology in such a quantum gravity emergent space time scenario? Again, in, in a way, in parallel with the distinction between uh, quantum gravity as a quantized GR and quantum gravity as a theory of some new type of degrees of freedom from which uh, space time emerges, you can have two views on cosmology. One is that uh, cosmology is just the sector of uh, the uh, gravitational theory that deals with uh, homogeneous or close to homogeneous uh, uh, global observables. At the quantum level, if you, just, you may just try to quantize those, uh, uh, that sector, and that's the idea of quantum cosmology, which has a lot of results. From the point of view in which uh, you know, space-time itself is the result of a coarse-graining uh, uh, approximation to uh, a different type of degrees of freedom, well, comes a, a corresponding, correspondingly different view on cosmology, um, in which uh, Cosmology is even more the result of a cost graining because you really want to cost grain your description from whatever are the fundamental non space time degrees of freedom only to those space time observables which are also global in nature and possibly also in a regime which is in a certain suitable sense close to equilibrium. This is basically the um, definition of an hydrodynamic regime. At least it's the intuitive picture of an hydrodynamic regime. In this sense, you could say that uh, in a theory of quantum gravity within which space time is emergent as a collective notion, cosmology has to be first of all looked at in the hydrodynamic approximation of the underlying theory. If that is true and you follow how, uh, what, what the template is for extracting uh, hydrodynamics from a quantum many body system, then you should expect that the basic variable of the corresponding uh, cosmological uh, rewriting of the uh, theory should be some sort of single body density function over the geometric data of mini superspace. This is just following. <coughs> the standard reconstruction of hydrodynamics from a quantum many body system with the appropriate translation terms. A theory that gives equations for this type of single, uh, single particle, single body density, which is a function of uh, mini superspace data, will be some nonlinear dynamics for such density, so a sort of a nonlinear generalization of uh, quantum cosmology. But of course, with a totally different interpretation, because you're not going to have a, a linear structure for solutions of the equations. So no Hilbert space for mini superspace wave functions. Um, and in the same spirit, what could be the interpretation of a, a transition from a non-geometric to a geometric phase? You can say, well, maybe there is a cosmological interpretation to that phase transition. Is exactly the uh, regime where uh, the uh, usual description fails and uh, uh, possibly even the aerodynamic approximation fails, that is uh, the Big Bang. So maybe in this picture, uh, what replaces the Big Bang in the full theory 
is the, back, the breakdown of the heterodynamic approximation associated to a, a geometric phase transition. Um, okay. So this gives a possible hypothetical cosmological interpretation for the uh, geometrogenesis process. And this is a picture. Um, okay, if you realize this type of idea, you're going to be facing the next step, which is uh, if I want to really interpret this phase transition as an event in the history of the universe, I want to extract predictions, I want to somehow make sure that there are some physical signatures of this hypothesis, you will have to face the problem I mentioned earlier, which is to connect the temporal evolution in the geometric phase to evolution in some quotation marks on theory space. So with your G-flow that uh, uh, connects different phases of the underlying theory. <coughs> So that's going to be an hypothesis? What? What you just said is going to be an hypothesis? Um, that there is a transition is an hypothesis, that it has a geometric interpretation, that it has some physical signature is an hypothesis. What I would, I would claim is uh, not an hypothesis, but at, after you accept the previous ones is a necessity, is that uh, in order to be able to say that there is some physical signature, you must uh, locate uh, the um, the phase transition at the would be big bang in the classical theory. And so somehow you have to connect the uh, evolution in the geometric phase where you can talk about uh, early universe and the big bang uh, at the classical level with the evolution on theory space. Otherwise I don't know how to con up in what sense I could say that the geometric the non-geometric phase is what the system ends up being on the other side of the big bang. No, no I agree that this is Sounds like the only kind of I'm not thing. I agree that this is. I'm the not saying it's true. That ah, in the sense, is an hypothesis. So I'm saying that uh, right. you have that's to right. face this problem as a logical consequence of the that's other right. assumptions, or of the facts. I suppose that you do find a phase transition, and that the theory says there may be some physical consequence. In order to really exploit that, you would have to answer this question. Okay, and now we will discuss. Uh, how to implement uh, one implementation we found of all these ideas in the quantum gravity formalism that I introduced earlier. Um, okay, so in case uh, you're already tired and you want to uh, nap for 10 minutes uh, uh, now, I, I first uh, flash the main ideas, the rest would be a sort of implementation of this So, first hypothesis, uh, we assume or we uh, focus on a condensate phase uh, for extracting the relevant continuum physics. As I said, this is supported by some results in uh, uh, group field theory normalization, but none of them is fully conclusive, so it remains an hypothesis. We focus on that. We have to choose on what sort of states, what sort of approximations to uh, look at in the complicated formalism, and we focus on condensate <coughs> states. Then we look for the aerodynamic approximation of the full quantum dynamics for condensate states in the full theory. So it's a further hypothesis that you have to look at the aerodynamic regime. Then the idea is that you have to turn the aerodynamic equations for your fields and observables into effective equations for observables in the full theory which admit a geometric interpretation because you want effective equations for geometry, for some effective geometry. The other idea is that the only notion of uh, evolution that you can give uh, in such geometric phase and for such observables is relational, meaning it will be in terms of relations between uh, some geometric observable and some internal degree of freedom you use as a clock. So this is standard uh, way to extract the uh, notion of evolution in cosmology, like quantum cosmology. So before you mention <coughs> to use the normalization group flow as, as, no, no. as a volume. Okay, no, maybe I was confused. What I mean is that in order to study whether there are different phases, you have to do the full renormalization group analysis. That comes with some notion of scale or some fine parameter along the trajectory and so on. 
there's no geometric interpretation as far as we know, no real temporal uh, notion associated with any such notion. So that analysis only is used to establish the existence of a condensate phase. Now we, we ask a different type of question. Assuming that the relevant phase for the system is a condensate phase, can we extract a notion of geometry, geometric evolution, gravitational physics there? In there, we are saying we need to find observables with a geometric interpretation and degrees of freedom in this geometric phase that we, that we can use as clocks. They may or may not be related at all to what we were using as a scale abstract scale in the randomization group analysis. It's a different step. And relating the two is what I was mentioning earlier, something you probably will have to do in order to extract physical consequences from the uh, phase transition itself. Right. I, I was confused because you, you mentioned also that the Big Bang should be a phase transition and the relation between the one phase and the other phase yeah. is the... A proper understanding of that statement, of that hypothesis, uh, will require somehow connecting uh, the uh, dynamics on, on phase space, on the, on the theory space, with the relational dynamics in the geometric phase. But now I'm only focusing on the dynamics in the geometric phase. As I said, all the previous talk about uh, uh, randomization group, it's only just to motivate why we look in particular for conden uh, condensate states as the interesting ones for extracting physics. But then now you are out of the Big Bang regime. You know, I'll, I'll I'm focusing or because first of all, I don't know if there is a Big Bang because right. I don't know if there is GR. But that question cannot be answered inside the condensate because you uh, are already in the face no, of, of not the directly. No, not directly. Uh, okay, and then the extra idea is that uh, you, you play humble and as our condensed matter physicists uh, do, you start with the simplest type of states, the simplest approximation, and then you improve. Okay, so this is the uh, Hilbert space we have, uh, Fox space. As I said, the generic quantum states have no uh, geometric interpretation. So the first problem is to identify quantum states in the fundamental Hilbert space uh, with some continuum space-time interpretation. And uh, the general result is that uh, you can give such an interpretation to uh, condensates of the uh, full quantum theory, which uh, can be seen as continuum homogeneous still quantum spaces. Why? Well, taking the simplest condensate, which is just an infinite superposition of uh, one body states, two body states, three body states, up to infinite number of uh, quanta, all with the same wave function. It means that if you try to embed all this uh, discrete data into some effective continuum and extract the geometry from the data on the quantum states, you're going to extract uh, the same uh, uh, data from each of the uh, uh, quantum particles or the quanta of your field theory. From the point of view of spin networks, if you come from there, this is an infinite state with an infinite number of degrees of freedom. It just happens to be so special that it's captured by a single wave function, the condensate wave function. Um, okay, the other point is that, in fact, if you look at this uh, condensate wave function and, and you look at the domain of the wave function, it is isomorphic to the mini superspace of homogeneous geometries. Why this is the case is basically because if you're really implementing the discrete geometry of the simplicial building blocks for each of them, that space is isomorphic to the uh, mini superspace of homogeneous geometries. So, uh, Details aside, now you have a wave function that uh, describes a state, uh, collectively a state with an infinite number of degrees of freedom, but is a single function, it is a function on mini superspace. The second problem, once you have uh, uh, this class of states singled out is interesting, is to extract uh, the effective hydrodynamics of the uh, system. And this is, uh, we are very lucky because uh, uh, you just take that class of states that I discussed, you plug it in the fundamental dynamics, say the Schinger-Dyson equations of your quantum field theory for the endpoint functions, 
uh, or you use whatever other method you like, you extract a nonlinear equation for the collective wave function. And this is exactly the uh, group field theory analog of the gross Pitaevsky hydrodynamics for uh, standard uh, BC, Bose condensates. It's, uh, luckily for me, which I didn't know anything about condensed matter, is uh, the first two, two chapters of the standard group of condensates. Maybe even the first one. Um, when you, once you look at it, uh, as I said, as a theory for wave functions on mini superspace, is indeed a nonlinear extension of quantum cosmology for the collective condensate wave function. Now, as I said, formally similar to quantum cosmology, but you are, uh, some of you are philosophers and you should realize that you're in a totally different conceptual uh, setup. There's no Hilbert space structure behind uh, the effective equation. There is a Hilbert space uh, for the fundamental theory, the Fox space I mentioned, but uh, there's no superposition of states of the universe uh, or no collapse of the cosmological wave function. It's more of a statistical nature for such wave function because it's the collective wave function, it's the density of the fluid, if you want. So there, there are a lot of uh, quantum mechanical uh, issues at the interpretation level, as we discussed, for the fundamental theory. At this level, this equation is like an hydrodynamic equation on mini superspace. Okay, so in this sense, you realize the, yeah. You told us before that it's very important to construct the space-time, how you join the different synthesis or mm -hmm. the different... Yeah. And here the joining was done in a... No, no, just in this in class of states, uh, there's no joining. So there's you neglected no exactly the correlation between the quanta. You gave them the same wave functions, in a the sense they are correlated, but not... Uh, in, in so I can't still think that, even though I have this isomorphism, I can, I'm not allowed to think that I have an homogeneous space you're allowed to, you have to say you have a homogeneous space in terms of what sort of observables you reconstruct. You can only reconstruct homogeneous observables. This is sort of a wild uh, coarse grading. In a sense, uh, you, you, the way you should understand it is uh, as the simplest type of approximation of the tentative uh, answers for the ground state, where, which of course would be uh, full of correlations and entanglement. I mean, a Bose condensate is not a realistic Bose condensate is not in the gross Pitaevsky ground state. The gross Pitaevsky ground state is used as the simplest approximation to capture the key features of the condensate phase and as an approximation to the highly correlated state that would be the actual ground state of the system, even for weak interactions. So, as I said, this is you. You use your assumptions first in the simplest approximation. You see if everything is compatible with the interpretation, and then you start improving, adding correlations, the gluing, and so on, as the strategy. Okay, let me. Uh, how much time do I have? Twenty minutes. How much time do I have? Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, there's quite so that includes the discussion time. So uh, what? Uh, <laughs> okay. Then I'll try to hurry up a little bit, but uh, almost done. So now again, uh, I'll give you the the key steps in uh, a concrete realization of this general uh, uh, program that I outlined with the same general results. What I said is indeed pretty general. In practice, if you want to extract one particular set of equations, you have to pick up one particular model at the fundamental level. So we do that. We pick up uh, uh, even a, a class of uh, concrete models used in uh, spin form models and, and uh, lattice uh, quantum gravity, so-called EPRL models for uh, uh, Lorentzian quantum gravity. Uh, plus we add uh, an additional variable to the pure geometric uh, simplicial data we had uh, at the beginning, a real variable which, uh, if you look at the Feynman amplitudes of the underlying theory, they give you a discretized path integral for gravity coupled to a scalar field, to a free massless uh, scalar field. So this uh, real variable for each field ends up playing the role of a discretized scalar field at the level of the building blocks. 
So it's like you added uh, a scalar field, and now you're looking for a continual approximation of that uh, uh, description. So you have the same type of condensate state with this additional uh, real variable. I'm pretty sure that I'll show you this. Yeah, so again, there is an interpretation for this data at a discrete gravity level. And now we look for the extraction of an effective continuum description of the same system. We further simplify uh, the condensate wave function to what is basically an isotropic uh, configuration. It's like equilateral tetrahedra with an additional real variable, which is a discretized uh, uh, scalar field. After a bunch of manipulations, you obtain some equation, nonlinear equation for the wave function. The equation has uh, derivatives with respect to the uh, real variable, the scalar field. Some parameters here are functions of the uh, geometric uh, sort of degree of freedom, which come from the initial model that we pick up. Uh, the same is for the interaction here. And it's a nonlinear equation. There is a quadratic part and a quartic. Part. Then we assume that the interaction part, although there, is uh, subdominant, so we focus on the previous, uh, on the free tier. Now, having uh, both geometric data and uh, the scalar field type data, you can define uh, in the fundamental theory, in the, as operators acting on the Hilbert space of the fundamental theory, what are basically relational observables. The simplest and key one is uh, uh, the volume coming from the contribution to the total volume of each of the tetrahedra for given value of the real scalar field. So it's a relational notion of volume. It's like the volume at the given value of the scalar field. It's a well-defined observable in the full Hilbert space. You compute the total second quantized uh, uh, expectation value in a condensate state, and you extract, and then you work with this expectation value. This is the V of phi that I write here. Similarly, you can construct uh, other uh, effective uh, observables, but again, as the result of expectation values in the condensate state of uh, microscopic observables. Sorry, is, is there already expectation values, or is there this is, a, this is a expectation value in the condensate state, and that's why it depends only on the condensate wave mm -hmm. function. Okay. Having these observables, you turn the equation for the condensate wave function into an effective equation for the observables. Again, long uh, manipulations, and you get two equations for the volume the, uh, the derivative of the volume with respect to the clock, with the relational uh, clock, and for the second derivative of the volume with respect to the clock. So, okay, there are complete equation depending on two uh, conserved quantities, uh, which have no obvious uh, interpretation except that Q is related to the uh, conserved momentum of the scalar field. And then you first of all check, and actually we did it uh, at the end uh, because we were scared, but uh, not in a presentation you do it first. You check uh, that uh, for a uh, uh, large volume, basically, uh, or small densities, the uh, equations you have here reduce uh, to the uh, classical Friedman equations for the volume in relational time. And a sufficient conditions for this is that uh, what is just a parameter of the theory, which is basically a function uh, of uh, the microscopic uh, parameters of the theory, is related, basically gives you an effective Newton constant. So if this condition is satisfied, then these equations become the Friedman equations uh, in relational time. So you're fine with the classical limit, as far as the volume observable is concerned. Of course, a lot of other things can go wrong. Is a question coming? Yeah. Yes. So simple question. Yes. So uh, the energy is, in principle, could be different. Mm -hmm. they are different. No, the condition here, in fact, if I want to be more precise, is that uh, there, at least, there exists at least one J, which uh, is uh, dominant 
in the large volume uh, regime such that uh, this e equality is true. If they're all equal and then it's true for all of them, then okay, it's in, in a stronger condition that it's not uh, required by anything. Moreover, you can prove that uh, there always exists at least one J such that uh, the density is, uh, is different from zero. Which means that the volume, so defined, remains positive at all times and with a single turning point. So what you find is that there is generically what would look like a quantum bounce in the volume observable. Mm -hmm. So there's no singularity there. Well, but if you care about the loop quantum cosmology, you can even show that if you take very special condensate states so that they only uh, depend on a single spin, then the effective equation you get is basically the loop quantum cosmology one with, uh, with some additional uh, state-dependent constant that you can set to zero with appropriate choice of states. And the fact that the single spin dominates uh, can actually be shown to be true as a result of the dynamics in several uh, cases. So it doesn't need to be necessarily an assumption. Okay, now, uh, uh, five minutes? Um, so, give it, I, I think we should maybe just, if you can wrap okay, up. Let's skip the table, all the questions. results, uh, all additional results. <laughs> if you want to know about inflation, I'll tell you. If you want to know about perturbations and other stuff, I can tell you. Let me just close by mentioning uh, singularities. In this scheme, what happens or what can happen to the cosmological singularity? Well, these are the logical possibilities I can think of before implementing them or not in the scheme. So space-time has to emerge. If space-time doesn't emerge, your theory is wrong. So I don't consider that possibility here. The singularity may just not be resolved. It's not that it's a logical necessity that the, our theory resolves uh, singularities. The singularity uh, may actually turn what out to be... be Sorry? What no, no, here I'm just listing the case in quantum gravity, and then ah. I tell you in our case what the singularity could be, or should be. The, there may be arguments for which the scenario can be made irrelevant, for example, for, uh, with the inflation for a long enough time, modulo the transplantian uh, issue. But I can imagine scenarios in which somehow there is a mechanism that washes away whatever property you have of the singularity. You may resolve the singularity at the hydrodynamic effective uh, spatial temporal level thanks to the quantum bounds or some other form of modified gravity theory. Or it could be that the hydrodynamic approximation fails around the would-be singularity, so there's simply no space-time description, not even quantum space-time description around there. And this is, uh, uh, and then if the hydrodynamic approximation fails because uh, you reach some quantum phase transition, quantum gravity phase transition, then it's the sort of emergent universe scenario that uh, uh, Rob, Robert was also mentioning. If the phase transition you're approaching is a transition from a non-geometric phase to a geometric phase, then is, you have the geometrogenesis that replaces the singularity. So in the context I, I, I gave you, in the specific quantum gravity formalism and within uh, um, uh, the, um, I would say, with the uh, GFT condensate cosmology, we found the bounds. So it would seem that you know we have a bounds and get a dynamic approximation. So it's like in loop quantum cosmology, but now in the full theory. So it's, it's great. <coughs> However, not, now I uh, you have to again be humble and list uh, what are the assumptions you made. So we were in a mean field restriction within an hydrodynamic approximation. So we totally neglected fluctuations. We stayed in the full hydrodynamic uh, approximation and we assumed that we just stayed in the condensate phase. So, yeah, so there could be uh, a big bounce uh, if uh, the uh, mean field approximation is uh, uh, improved, but there's no breakdown of hydrodynamics uh, uh, overall. 
in this sense, then if this happens, then yes, we have a cosmic quantum bounce predicted by our quantum gravity formula. And that's this. But this is again, if the hydrodynamic approximation holds, and if we stay within the condensate phase. The hydrodynamic approximation can break down because uh, you start uh, uh, focusing on the very, very small densities. Too few atoms are involved uh, or such values of the density, so you don't trust anymore the aerodynamic approximation. But also, usually when that happens, fluctuations become too big. In this case, you really have a disappearance of continuum spacetime, because you have a good notion of a continuum geometric observables only in that approximation. And that's the disappearance. If the the reason why the hydrodynamic precision fails is that the quantum fluctuations start driving the system, including all the coupling constants, towards the phase transition, and you reach a criticality. Then you have the even more radical disappearance I mentioned at the very beginning. And you have a geometrogenesis phase transition, for which, uh, OK. So you're really out of the spatial temporal phase, and not just beyond uh, space and time. And uh, I think I can close by mentioning that uh, all these scenarios uh, see a precise realization in the formalism, and they can be tested. So there are calculations you can do in the fundamental theory to check which one of them applies or doesn't apply. And this is the list of calculations I can think of, or of questions I can think of to address to know what the fate is of the cosmological singularity. Thank you. Yes, we have. We can go into the break a little bit, so we'll get about ten minutes for questions, if that's what's needed. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we'll ask one of those philosophical questions. Um, so, in case of. Um, uh, geometrogenesis, so we have a transition from a non-spatial temporal phase to a, a spatial temporal phase. So here we are using the vocabulary of phase transitions, of phase, so everything is kind of temporal in a way. So would you, do you think of the situation as, well, we have some kind of second time, a meta time or something, recording whether the underlying system is going through Special number phases and not special number phases. Okay. Is this a kind of idea you have in mind? Mm -hmm. So, it's, um, so that yeah, sorry. So there are two points on on the fact of um, on the question of whether and how uh, an understanding of a phase transition or a definition of phase transition has to be temporal in some sense. Uh, then you can ask uh, your neighbor, and there are notions of uh, you know, having a phase transition, not the other neighbor. Of, 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 an emer of emergence which uh, are not understood to be temporal poses at all, don't need to be understood in that sense, and it is that notion of uh, emergence and phase transitions that uh, can only apply at first uh, at this level. Uh, the second question is the more physical one that I was uh, hinting at earlier. If you want them to uh, study for physical uh, consequences, of the existence in the mathematics of your theory of a phase transition of that type, then you need, as I mentioned, to relate somehow the temporal evolution, maybe relational internal variables in the geometric phase, to the evolution on phase space, on the theory space, on the space of uh, possible uh, phases. One idea I have there, um, but the, the, the friend uh, we are doing the project with is now busy with teaching. Um, so we don't have results, is that, uh, so as I said, uh, you can set up a renormalization group flows uh, for these uh, field theories. That requires that you choose some uh, internal observable, some quantity in the theory that you, you, that you use as the affine parameter along your G-flow. Uh, that's your scale. The idea would be to now redo most of the analysis that have been done for the gravitational models, for models including uh, the scalar field that I mentioned earlier, which is used as a relational clock uh, in, uh, in the cosmological uh, formulation, 
and uh, use that clock, that variable, uh, as uh, the uh, parameter along which you compute your G-flow. If you do that, then there is a clear notion in which uh, there is early <coughs> times, late times in the geometric phase, and you can check if at early times you, what you're matching is the RG flow uh, as defined by the uh, full RG analysis in terms of the same quantity. But you need to have this matching of uh, the scale and the more abstract uh, RG flow uh, formulation with uh, the clock we use to extract uh, cosmological evolution. That would be the, the, the idea. You, you mentioned that um, yeah. You mentioned that near the Planck scale quantum fluctuations could grow and mm -hmm. could kick you out from the hydrodynamical phase and have a pre geometric phase, emerging universe, etc. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned could. Do you have any any you mentioned that they could. could. Ah, yeah, yeah, sure. Do you have any intuition or preliminary results that indicate one possibility or, or the other? So you want to know if it is likely that they do or likely that they don't. Uh, so we know, because we've done the calculation, that they're certainly not relevant at the, the moment the universe expands. Because you can compute volume fluctuations for the same observable we, I, we, we used to describe the, the homogeneous evolution and uh, they are suppressed being extensive quantities they are suppressed with the, with the total volume so that's okay the problem is at low densities which is exactly what happens in our scheme at the, at the bounds there it may depend on the parameters of your model so it actually is a constraint on the parameters of your model whether the fluctuation become too big or too small or, or they are still uh, and you are thinking about fluctuations in the volume, so it's still it's the time. first one. So far, I only discussed the evolution of the volume. Homogeneous uh, sector, not the fluctuations. No, no, no. We are talking really about the quantum fluctuations for the same observable we, we used uh, to describe the global evolution. Uh, of course, uh, the second step uh, is a different type. Uh, I studied uh, a particular class of solutions to the full uh, quantum dynamics, the ones that have an interpretation as homogeneous uh, universes. You can take fluctuations in the fundamental dynamics around them and check if the system is stable under those fluctuations. That's the, also a calculation you can do. I mean, there's no obstacle in principle. There is an obstacle in time and, uh, and um, computational abilities. But with smart collaborators, you can, you can do a lot. Josh, is that? Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, we talked about up here, uh, we have a special condensate state that then gets mapped into some uh, continuous geometry. Mm -hmm. right? Not all states are condensate states. Can you tell me a little bit more about what makes these states special? Or what do we need in order for it to be a condensate state? Okay, what makes this, what makes this state uh, special? Okay, so I try to motivate why we first focus on condensate states because uh, um, we look for non-trivial phases uh, of, uh, of the theory and the RG flow studies that we've done so far seems to suggest that the first type of non-trivial phases uh, we're going to encounter are the condensate type. That's one reason. The other reason is also what I mentioned, that uh, the com this uh, idea of uh, um, condensation of different quanta being uh, at least approximately with the same wave function is a sort of a quantum part of homogeneity. So in this sense, uh, they, they, have a, they have a rather straightforward interpretation in terms of homogeneous uh, geometries. The third reason that I probably should state so openly in public is that they are so simple. This, that condensate state is really so simple uh, that uh, assuming that's a good approximation to the ground state, that the hydrodynamics can be literally extracted in uh, 10 lines of calculation from the fundamental quantum dynamics. In general, the problem of extracting uh, the hydrodynamic effective equation from some generic state is incredibly hard. Unless, of course, you know all the symmetries of your theory and so on, which we don't fully control for this class of field theories. Otherwise, you wouldn't look at the microscopic derivation. You just uh, list your symmetries and write down the most general thing that, that is compatible with that. But it requires a lot of understanding of a different type. Okay. 
will be the last question. Okay. <clears throat> It has two parts. One of it is, I would like to know if you agree with the following statement. Yes. The fact that you have, <laughs> the fact that you have uh, constructed this condensate or this description of you know many many copies of things on the same mm -hmm. state should not be yet considered as equivalent of recovering an homogeneous space time in the following sense. The relation between the different elements of, 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 of or even of a space, even though they are identical, the pieces are identical. The relationship between one and the and the neighboring one is very different than the relationship between that one and a farther away. In other uh, and one that is far away. In other words, there should you should be able to extract some notion of. Two, point, two elements that are very distant and two points that are very close, even though they are all here appearing in the same, in the same footing. And the second question, that, so the first, this one is a yes or no, but the second one uh, uh, is, is a more, uh, seems like to be a more bothersome one. Uh, these uh, correlations, these quantum correlations that uh, we, we need to have in order to recover something that uh, could be considered as, uh, let's say, an homogeneous space thing, are probably very com complex correlations. Because, for instance, if I look at the field part, just a simple scalar field part, I know that, you know, in, for instance, in the vacuum state, which is only homogeneous, the uh, correlations, the quantum correlations, depend very, very particularly on the separation. Otherwise, your state is not the Hadamard state. You don't have a Hadamard. You don't have a Hadamard type uh, correlation between the two-point two functions, uh, and therefore establishing that kind of complex correlation is is something that would have to be, you know, required in order to say yes, I have obtained something sensible. Okay. So um, I, I told you I agreed, right? So uh, I agree with the, with the general point. Let me let me clarify uh, the, how, how I see this task uh, in, in in my language or in this uh, context. So there, there are two points. So your argument has to do with the um, the physical characterization of homogeneous uh, geometries, and the statement about the universe being homogeneous is really a statement about inhomogeneities doing something. Being, uh, being possible to neglect them in some way or being uh, correlated in such a way that, uh, you know, I mean, you need to know what your inhomogeneous sector really is physically to say that uh, you have gravity, first of all, and second, that uh, in a certain approximation everything looks just homogeneous. So from this point of view, it requires much more than just extracting an effective Friedman dynamics. You need to extract a good physics of inhomogeneities and then show that there is an appropriate uh, sector of that or approximation of that uh, or cross graining of that at the continuum level that gives you the homogeneous uh, description. In fact, the same is true at the fundamental quantum level in the sense that, uh, as I emphasized earlier, there's no pretense that the ground state of the system of an interacting quantum field theory, although more abstract and so on, is uh, so simple, uh, and in particular uh, such that you can basically neglect all the correlations and the entanglement and so on. This is clearly false. It, at best, it's an approximation to something else. So at the level of the quantum description, before you look for the geometric interpretation, you should also show that uh, the type of state for which you had an approximate interpretation as a homogeneous geometry is a re reasonable approximation of uh, a more realistic ground state of the theory. And again, this means that you first have to control the quantum correlations of the fundamental theory and then show that in a certain regime, the one that you used earlier, they can indeed be neglected. And so they are both very complex uh, tasks. And yeah, of course, I'm aware of that. And they're open. Uh, I can tell you some partial results on each of this, but yes, of course, they're open. Otherwise, I would tell you the, the, the full story, right? Of the oh. stupid approximation. Thank you. <laughs> so, where are facts? So, like, do you have any thanking Daniel again?